Others have asked me why I went to the woods and what I did when I lived there. I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life and see if I could not learn what it had to teach and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. I learned this, at least, by my experiment. If one advances confidently in the direction of one's dreams and endeavors to live the life of which one has imagined, one will meet with a success unexpected in common hours. If you have built castles near, your work need not be lost. That is where they should be. Now put the foundations under them, for I know of no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of an individual to elevate one's life by a conscious endeavor. Simplify. 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 For one is rich in proportion to the amount of things one can afford to let alone. And in proportion, as one simplifies one's life, the laws of the universe will appear less complex. And solitude will not be solitude. Nor poverty, poverty. Nor weakness, weakness. I say, beware of all enterprises that require the wearing of new clothes, and not rather a new wear of clothes. If you have any enterprise before you, try it in your old clothes. No person ever stood the lower in my estimation for having a patch on their clothes. But most people behave as if they believed that their prospects for life would be ruined if they should do it. They could more easily hobble into town with a broken leg than with a broken pantaloon. I have traveled a good deal in Concord. And everywhere, in shops, in offices, and fields, the inhabitants appear to me to be doing penance in a thousand remarkable ways. The twelve labors of Hercules were trifling in comparison to those which my neighbors have undertaken. For his were only twelve and had an end. But I never saw that any of my neighbors ever slew or captured any monster or finished any labor. It is hard to have a southern overseer. It is worse to have a northern one. But worst of all, when one is the slave driver of oneself, the true cost of something is the amount of that which I will call life which must be exchanged for it immediately or in the future. If I should sell both my mornings and afternoons to society, as most appear to do, I am sure that for me there would be nothing left worth living for. I wish to suggest that one may be very industrious and yet not spend one's time well. It is not enough to be busy. So are the ants. The question is, what are we busy about? What fence do we have our ladders up? Most people lead lives of quiet desperation. What is called resignation is confirmed desperation. From the desperate city, we go to the desperate country and have to console ourselves with the bravery of minks and muskrats. It is a characteristic of wisdom not to do desperate things. Why should we be in such desperate haste to succeed and in such desperate enterprises? If a man does not keep pace with his companions, perhaps it is because he hears a different drummer let him step to the music which he hears, however measured or far away. If a man walks in the woods a half of each day, 
he is in danger of being considered a loafer. But if he spends his whole day as a speculator, shearing off those woods and making nature bald before her time, he is esteemed an enterprising and industrious citizen, as if the town had no interest in its forests but to cut them down. At present, in this vicinity, the best part of the land is not private property. The landscape is not owned, and the walker enjoys a comparative freedom. But there may come a time when it will be partitioned off into so-called pleasure grounds in which a few will take a narrow and exclusive pleasure only, when fences shall be multiplied and man traps and other engines invented to confine people to the public road and walking over the surface of God's earth shall be construed to mean trespassing on some gentleman's grounds to enjoy a thing exclusively is commonly to exclude oneself from the true enjoyment of it. Let us improve our opportunities then before such evil days come. What are the natural features which make a township handsome. A stream with rocks and boulders. A river with its waterfalls and meadows. A forest with ancient trees standing singly. Such things are beautiful. They have a higher value which dollars and cents never represent. If the inhabitants of a town were wise, they would seek to preserve such features. And it would be worth the while if in every town there were a committee appointed to see that the beauty of the town received no detriment. If we have the largest boulder in the county, it should not belong to an individual nor be made into doorsteps. Each town should have a park, or rather a primitive forest of some 500 or 1,000 acres in which a stick would never be cut for fuel. A common resource for all, for inspiration, our own true recreation. Let us keep the new world new preserving all the advantages that living in this country has to offer. All of Walden Woods might have been preserved in a park forever with Walden Pond in its midst. And the Easterbrook country, an unoccupied area of some four square miles, might have been a public huckleberry field. If there are any owners of these tracks, who are close to leaving this world without any natural heirs who deserve or need to be specially remembered, such owners would do wisely to abandon their possessions to all rather than will them to some individual who may have enough already, as some give to Harvard College or another institution. Why might not Another give a forest or a huckleberry field to Concord. A town is an institution worthy of being remembered. We boast of our system of education, but why stop at schoolmasters and schoolhouses? We are all schoolmasters, and our schoolhouse is the universe. A lake is the landscape's most beautiful and expressive feature. Walden is blue at one time and green at another. 
even from the same point of view. From a hilltop, it reflects the color of the sky, while near at hand it is of a yellowish tint and then gradually deepens to a uniform dark green. Many an hour have I spent floating on Walden's surface, having paddled my boat out to the middle and lying on my back across the seats in a summer's morning, dreaming awake, until I was aroused by the boat touching sand, and I arose to see what shores my fates had impelled me to. Days when idleness was the most attractive and productive industry. Many a morning have I stolen away, preferring to spend thus the most valued part of the day, for I was rich, if not in money, in sunny hours, and I spent them lavishly. As I was paddling along the North Shore one very calm October afternoon, having been looking over the pond in vain for a loon, when suddenly one set up its wild laughter, betraying itself as it sailed out from the shore towards the middle, about 15 yards in front of me. I pursued with paddle, and it dove, and when it came up, I was nearer than before, and immediately it dove again. But this time, I had miscalculated the direction it would take, and we were 200 yards apart when it came up again, for I had helped to widen the interval between us by my misdirected paddling. And again the loon laughed loud and long and with more reason than before. For over an hour it continued to so cunningly maneuver I, I could not get again within 30 yards of it. I found it was as well to rest on my oars as to endeavor to calculate where it might come up next. For again and again as I was straining my eyes in one direction over the pond, I would be suddenly startled by its wild laughter behind me. Its usual note was this demonic laughter, yet somewhat like that of a waterfowl. But occasionally, when it had balked me most successfully and come up a long ways off, it uttered a long drawn, prolonged howl, more like that perhaps of a a wolf than any bird, as when a beast puts its muzzle to the ground and deliberately howls. Such was its looning, perhaps the wildest sound ever heard in these parts, making the woods ring far and wide. I concluded that it laughed in derision of my efforts, confident of its own resources, and though the sky was by now overcast. The surface of the pond was smooth, and I could see where the bird broke the surface even when I did not hear it. At length, after having come up a long ways off, it uttered one of those prolonged howls, as if calling on the god of loons to aid it, and immediately there came up a wind from the east, rippling the pond and filling the whole air with misty rain. I was impressed, as if the prayer of the loon had been answered, and its God was angry with me. And so I left it, disappearing far away on the tumultuous surface of the pond. Alone, in distant woods or fields, in unpretending sproutlands and pastures trapped by rabbits, even an oblique and to most cheerless day like this, when a villager would be thinking of his inn, I come to myself. I once more feel myself grandly related, and that cold and solitude are friends of mine. I suppose that this value, in my case, is equivalent to what others get by church-going and prayer. 
I come to my solitary woodland walks as the homesick go home. I thus dispose of the superfluous and see things as they are, grand and beautiful. I have told many that I walk every day about half the daylight, but I think they do not believe it. I wish to get the Concord, the Massachusetts, the America out of my head and be sane, a part of every day. And therefore, I come out to these solitudes where the problem of existence is simplified. I get away a mile or two from the town into the stillness and solitude of nature with rocks, trees, and weeds about me. I enter some glade in the woods perchance, where a few weeds and dried leaves alone lift themselves above the surface of the snow. It is as if I had come to an open window. I see out and around myself the stillness, solitude, wildness of nature is like a, a bone set to my intellect. This is what I go out to seek. It is as if I always met in those places some grand, serene, immortal, infinitely encouraging, though invisible, companion, and walked with him. I wish to speak a word for nature, for absolute freedom and wildness. I love nature partly because she is not man, but a retreat from him. None of his institutions control or pervade over her. In nature, a different kind of right prevails. In her midst, I can be glad with an entire gladness. If this world were all man, I should lose all hope. I could not stretch myself. He is constrained. Freedom to me. He makes me wish for another world. She makes me content with this one. I had three chairs in my house, one for solitude, two for friendship, and three for society. The one who came farthest to my lodge through deepest snows and most dismal tempest was a poet, a farmer, a hunter, a soldier, a reporter, even a philosopher may be daunted, but nothing can deter a poet. For a poet is actuated by pure love. There was one other with whom I had many solid seasons long to be remembered at his house in the village who looked in on me from time to time. Ah, Waldo. I talked or tried to talk to him, lost my time, nay, almost my identity, he assuming a false opposition where there was no difference of opinion, told me what I knew, talked to the wind, and I lost my time trying to imagine myself somebody else to oppose him. 
if there is anyone with whom we have quarrel, most likely it is because they make some just demand on us, which we disappoint. Friends are kind to one another's dreams. Commonly, in friendship and in love, it is the imagination that is wounded first rather than the heart. We can forgive almost any offense against the heart, but not against the imagination. The finest quality of our nature is like the bloom on fruits, only preserved through the most delicate of handling. Yet we do not treat ourselves nor one another thus tenderly. After having had some business dealings with men, I am occasionally chagrined and feel as though I had some wrong, and it is hard to forget the ugly circumstances, and I see that such contact, long continued, would leave one thoroughly prosaic, hard, and coarse. And yet, the longest contact with nature, though in her rudest moods, does not thus harden and make coarse. A hard, insensible man, whom we liken to a rock, is indeed much harder than a rock. From hard, coarse, insensible men, with whom I have no sympathy, I go to commune with rocks whose hearts are comparatively soft. I am myself the nature of stone. It takes the summer sun to warm it. One July afternoon, while I was living at Walden, I walked into town to retrieve a mended shoe from the shoemakers, but I was intercepted and arrested, for I had paid no poll tax in six years. And as I stood considering the stone walls two or three feet thick, and the door of wood and iron a foot thick, and the iron grating in the window which strained the light, I saw that if there was a thick stone wall between me and my fellow townsmen, there was still a more difficult one to break or climb through before they could get to be as free as I was. I did not for a moment feel constrained, and the thick walls seemed a great waste of stone and mortar. I felt as if I alone, of all my townsmen, had paid my tax. Practically speaking, the true opponents to a reform in Massachusetts are not a hundred thousand politicians in the South, but a hundred thousand merchants and farmers here in the North who are more interested in agriculture and commerce than they are in humanity and are not prepared to do justice to the slave or to Mexico. There are thousands who, in opinion, are opposed to slavery and to the war with Mexico, who yet, in effect, do nothing to put an end to them. Must a citizen ever for a moment or to the least degree resign one's conscience to one's legislator? Why then has everyone a conscience? I think we should be individuals first and subjects afterwards. It is not desirable to cultivate our respect for the law so much as for the right. The only obligation I have a right to assume is to do at any time what I think right. A common and natural product of an undue respect for the law may be seen in a file of soldiers marching in admirable order with colonel, captain, sergeant, 
private, powder monkey and all, over hill and dale to the wars, against their wills, against their common sense and consciences, which makes for steep marching indeed, and produces a palpitation of the heart. They have no doubt it is a damnable business in which they are engaged. They are all peaceably inclined. But what are they then? Are they men at all, or merely movable forts and magazines at the service of some unscrupulous man in power? Under a government which imprisons any unjustly, the true place for a just man is also prison. It is there that the fugitive slave and the Mexican prisoner on parole and the Indian should find them on that separate but freer and more honorable ground where the state puts those who are not with it but against it. The only house in a slave state where a free man can reside with honor. When I came out of prison, for someone interfered and paid my fine, as I had been on my way to the shoemakers when I was arrested, when I was released in the morning, I completed my errand. And after putting on my mended shoe, I met up with a huckleberry party who were eager to be put under my conduct. And within a short while, we were two miles outside of town on one of our highest hills in the midst of a huckleberry field. And the state was nowhere to be seen. Each phase of nature, while not invisible, is yet not too distinct and obtrusive. It is there to be found when we look for it, but not demanding our attention. It is like a silent but sympathizing companion in whose company we retain most of the advantages of solitude, with whom we can walk and talk or be silent naturally without the necessity of talking in a strain foreign to the place. I know of but one or two persons with whom I can afford to walk. With most, the walk degenerates into a more vigorous use of your legs, ludicrously purposeless while you are discussing some mighty argument, each one having his say, spoiling each other's day, worrying one another with conversation. I know of no use in the walking part in this case, except that we may seem to be getting on together towards some goal. But of course we keep our original distance all the way, jumping every wall and ditch with vigor in the vain hope of shaking your companion off, trying to kill two birds with one stone, though they sit at opposite points of compass, to see nature and do the honors to one who does not. This winter, they are cutting down our trees more seriously than ever. And nowadays, almost all our so-called improvements simply converts the country into the town. And this building of houses and cutting down of forest and all large trees simply deforms the landscape and makes it more tame and cheap. What good is a house, I ask you, if you haven't got a decent planet to put it on? One late December afternoon, being on Fairhaven Hill, I heard the sound of sawing, and soon after, from the cliff above, I saw below two men about 200 yards off, sawing down a noble pine, the last of a dozen or more trees which were left when the forest was cut, and for 15 years have waved in solitary majesty over the sprout land. I saw those men like beavers or insects gnawing at the trunk of this noble tree, 
the diminutive mannequins with their cross-cut saw, which could scarcely span it. I watch closely to see when it begins to move. And now their sawing stops, and with an ax they open it a little on the side towards which it leans, that it may break the faster. And now their sawing begins again. Now surely is going, is inclined one quarter of the quadrant, and breathless I expect its crashing fall. But no, I was mistaken. It has not moved an inch. It stands at the same angle as at first. It is 15 minutes yet to its fall. Its branches still wave in the wind as if it was destined to stand for yet another century. And the wind sows through its needles as of yore. It is still the most majestic tree that waves over the Musketaquid River. The silvery sheen of sunlight is reflected from its needles. It still affords an inaccessible crotch where the squirrels nest, and not a lichen has forsaken its mass-like stem, its raking mast. The hillside is the hull, but now Now's the moment. The mannequins at its base are fleeing from their crown. They've dropped the guilty saws and axe. And now, and now, now's the moment. How majestically it starts, as if it was only swayed by a summer breeze and would return without a sigh to its location in the air. And now it fans the hillside with its fall, lying down in its bed in the valley from which it is never to rise as softly as a feather, folding its green mantle around it like a warrior, as if tired of standing. It embraced the earth with silent joy, returning its elements to the dust again. But hark, you only saw but did not hear. There now comes up to these rocks a deafening crash, advertising you that even trees do not die without a groan. It is lumber. When the fish hawk revisits the banks of the Musketaquid in the spring, it will circle in vain to find its accustomed perch, and the hen hawk will mourn for the pines lofty enough to protect its brood. But I hear no knell told. I see no procession of mourners in the streets or in the woodland aisles. The squirrel has leaped to another tree. The hawk has circled farther off and settled upon a new perch. But the woodsman is preparing to lay his axe to the roots of that tree also. Far too many people, it seems to me, do not really care for nature and would sell their share in all her beauty for the rest of their lives for a stated sum. And it's for the very reason that some do not care for nature, that those who do care must continue to protect it from the vandalism of those who do not. Thank God we cannot as yet fly and lay waste the sky as well as the earth. We are safe on that account at present. Our village life would stagnate without the unexplored forest and meadows which surround it. How near to the good is what is wild. Life consists of wildness. Its presence refreshes us. The most alive are the wildest. We need the tonic of wildness to wade sometimes in marshes where the bittern and the meadow hen lurk and hear the booming of the snipe and smell the whispering sedge where only some wilder and more solitary fowl builds her nest and the mink crawls with its belly close to the ground. What I have been preparing to say is that in wildness is the preservation 
of the world.